Hi, thank you so much for this introduction. Um, so I wanted to uh, thank all the organizers for inviting uh, me to speak, and I will jump into uh, the presentation about radiation considerations and low-grade glioma uh, following many of my predecessors who have already explained um, a lot of the details um, with their excellent presentations in terms of our management. So for our low grade gliomas, just as Dr. Hughes had mentioned, we have now started to think of them in different buckets, more based on the molecular feature. And based on the New England Journal of Medicine presentation, the IDH mutant patients that are 1P19 co-deleted are considered oligodendrogliomas in true low grades. And those that are IDH mutant, even without 1P19Q co-deletion are also considered our low grades but we are no longer thinking about the IDH wild types as our historical cons consideration for grade twos and grade threes. And that's based on these features here where we can now divide these patients out by type one and type two patients based on uh, their uh, prognosis. And so these type one patients uh, do the best and those would be most consistent with our oligodendrogliomas. And then uh, the type two patients are low grade astros. And then our type three patients are the ones with IDH wild type, which we do recognize can have outcomes that are very poor. And in some senses could be um, closer to the outcomes of our historical histological GBMs. But you can also see from this graph that they still do better than they do. And so they may be a slightly um, different pop population. Moving on to our management, I just wanted to outline how presently we tend to think about the management for these low-grade glioma patients when a lot of the literature did not necessarily look um, at specifically the molecular status and how we have tried to integrate that into our practice here at MD Anderson. Uh, this is a review that I um, had, uh, published as a senior author with uh, my colleagues and with input from both the neuro-oncology and uh, RADONC uh, uh, members. And so, the summary uh, to this is that for our current practice, and it does vary case by case, for grade two patients that are less than uh, 40 years old and have a gross total resection, we tend to offer them um, oftentimes close surveillance. For the grade two patients with at least one high risk feature, there is consideration for potentially early radiation therapy. Um, but of course, now we do take a, into account a lot more what the other features are and whether or not they could potentially also still be considered for um, close surveillance on a case by, by case basis. For our grade two patients um, that are IDH mutant or, or 1P19Q code deleted, um, if they have a subtotal resection, our preference is to offer them adjuvant radiation therapy. So 50.4 to 54 gray, and then adjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, based on um, RTOG 9802. You can also be considered for BN005 as a clinical trial, which I'll go into more later. And of these recommendations, the ones that you could say we tend to follow a little bit more closely are these two. Our next group of patients in terms of our grade two gliomas uh, that have multiple high-risk features, at least uh, three or more, um, regardless of gross total resection or subtotal resection, we tend to, you can offer them adjuvant radiation therapy uh, to 54 gray, the initial trial did 50.4 um, uh, uh, with a concurrent and adjuvant chemotherapy, uh, but that's based on RTG 0424. And sometimes uh, we discuss this uh, for certain patients. For our grade three patients, we have a well-established standard of offering them adjuvant radiation therapy. And that treatment uh, doses to 59.4 gray uh, based on the ERTC and the RTOG studies. Um, having said that though, at MD Anderson, we also have a publication uh, where we have our own practice of instead of using sequential radiation therapy, we do simultaneously integrated boosts. And in that case, we actually treat patients to 57 gray and 1.9 um, uh, gray per fraction. Patients uh, can also be considered for um, BN005 on this particular, uh, the BN005 trial for this particular cohort. And I'd say that more so in terms of offering them adjuvant radiation therapy and um, uh, sequential uh, chemotherapy, that's more commonly uh, the practice uh, for this particular cohort. Uh, 
So now to go into a little bit of the data, I we had some wonderful reviews already of uh, some of the data and some of the prior presentations. So I'll just highlight some of the things that I like to discuss either with colleagues or with patients when they ask about um, uh, outcomes and things uh, related to radiation treatment. So for 9802, uh, which was the low risk, low grade arm, I think an important takeaway, even though this group uh, in included a wide variety of patients likely with different molecular status, is that uh, the progression-free survival at five years was still approximately you know, 50%, it was like 48%. And so that tends to support for us doing close surveillance uh, in uh, the cohort of patients that meet this. For the high-risk group in the randomized controlled trial, uh, we uh, do offer them adjuvant radiation therapy and then sequential chemotherapy based on the improved overall survival and progression-free survival for these patients, and more importantly, for those with the subtotal resection. The component for age is not as hard a cutoff for us, and that has to do with the fact that, you know, we now have more molecular information of, about patients, but then also there is a meta-analysis by Brown et al., which showed that when you're combining a lot of these studies, you can actually, the age com component actually did not um, uh, become as prognostic when you're just using a hard cutoff of uh, just 40. So it becomes more of a discussion. The next study uh, that was important, at least for the radiation oncologists um, to highlight is uh, the EROTC study or the non-believers uh, studies that it's sometimes uh, called, at least in the United States. And that randomized patients to early radiation therapy versus delayed radiation therapy. And of course, we acknowledge that um, in this study, uh, you know, patients had an improved progression-free survival with benefit with early radiation therapy, but no uh, necessarily improvement in the overall survival. But I think because it's a study that at least provides us in the historical sense, some information about how patients do um, with observation, it does uh, give us a sense of you know, how patients' outcomes uh, might be when we're counseling patients now. And so for seizure uh, risk, for instance, seizure risk actually went down for patients uh, who received uh, early radiation therapy. Um, so 25% versus uh, 41%. And not so much that we're necessarily always advocating for early, but just in the sense that when patients talk about, you know, their risk of seizures with radiation, we often have to highlight the fact that actually treatment of the tumor, if their tumor is causing seizures, uh, will actually um, be improved with radiation and that radiation does address that. It's also important to note that the transformation rate to high risk or sorry to high grade tumors um, was still high for this heterogeneous cohort, regardless of whether or not they received radiation. And actually, it was not statistically dis different between the two groups. Uh, essentially, you know, 66 versus 72 percent. So, an approximate 70 percent, um, you know, transformation to higher grade for these tumors were independent of radiation, and also addresses sometimes other questions that either patients or our colleagues ask about, you know, whether or not they should get radiation therapy, um, uh, and if that would potentially increase uh, their risk for uh, transformation to a higher grade. And, and we can tell them uh, that that answer would be no. 65% um, of the patients actually um, in the cohort group of note also actually received radiation at progression. So this really just summarizes for us that you know, rate early radiation can improve their progression-free survival um, and help uh, uh, with uh, refractory seizures, but does not necessarily Im impact overall survival. In the modern era of radiation therapy, um, we have from R2G0424, which had at least three high-risk uh, features um, with the use of 50.4 and concurrent and adjuvant TMZ, uh, we are able to sort of describe that at least three, the three year overall survival for these patients was very good um, at 73% and significantly higher than our historical control for the same cohort of patients that was um, uh, included. Of course, this included, you know, mutants as well as IDH wild type, but at the same time, the historical control baseline would have been 54%. And then for ERTC 22033, which was a high risk study um, with at least one high risk feature randomizing patients to radiation versus adjuvant temozolomide, um, as has been described earlier, the progression free survival with radiation was improved, even though it was not statistically significant. And then uh, we'll go into more details about BNC05, which is the current study that is open nationally in the United States uh, for um, what we are traditionally now considering our lower grade tumors, uh, the IDH mutant and grade two and grade three gliomas, where they receive 54 gray with sequential temozolomide with the role of this being randomization to protons versus IMRT. Uh, 
So I wanted to ask a question of the group and, and everyone can answer this individually uh, you know, for themselves, uh, but in terms of your thoughts, so in the high risk low grade glioma uh, study, um, ERTC 22033, where patients were randomized to either radiation therapy versus temozolomide uh, for 12 cycles, what were the findings of the health related quality of life and the mini mental status uh, exam scores for both cohorts? So, was it that the radiation therapy group had significantly worse changes in mini mental status scores than the temozolomide group at three years? Was there no significant difference between the groups or changes in, in the mini mental status scores at th approximately three years follow up? Or, the temozol or did the temozolomide group have a significantly worse change in mini mental status score uh, than the radiation group at three years? So for those of you that answered that there was no significant difference, uh, you would be correct. I openly acknowledge um, after Dr. You know, uh, Weifel's excellent uh, talk that you know, the mini mental status test is um, still a crude measure for um, neurocognition and uh, you know, his group as well as others do a much uh, more detailed um, and sensitive test for neurocognition. But I think it's important for the way in which we counsel patients with these low grade patients that we want to explain to them you know, what radiation's impact will be or if they're trying to decide between treatment or not, um, what to expect. And what we find though is actually there wasn't any significant difference between you know, getting radiation treatment and getting chemo brain um, as well is that the, the unfortunately um, we do know that you know there might be subtle differences um, but at the same time uh, when patients um, are particularly hesitant about radiation therapy to control their brain tumor um, we can at least assure them that it you know is um, you know on par with other therapeutic agents and that also uh, we um, are not uh, looking to necessarily cause them a great uh, deal of uh, deficits. Um, and also their quality of life uh, in um, terms of their three-year um, uh, um, outcomes is also fairly similar. Having said that, as a radiation oncologist, we are always looking to improve uh, the outcomes for patients and to minimize toxicity. And we spend a lot of time making sure that we're thinking about that for patients who are going to have these long-term um, sequelae of radiation therapy uh, and assessing you know, what their cognition is and how can we improve that. And with that, that goes into the discussion of protons versus IMRT. Um, and for the non-radiation oncologists in the audience, um, IMRT or VMAT um, are uh, the new uh, fancy versions, you could say, of radiation therapy. What I like to explain to patients is that while these are photon uh, radiation therapy, it's not the photon radiation therapy that people recall from uh, the 1980s or even the 1990s when some of the studies actually that we are describing um, were begun. Um, it is the difference between you know, using a payphone and using your current iPhone. Um, that's just how the technology is improved. But having said that, we still want to see as you know, glioma uh, patients' survival is improving. Um, and as we know that low-dose radiation therapy to structures like the hippocampi can have an impact in patients, we want to see what we can do to improve that. And so that goes into um, this illustration is that the goals of radiation therapy are really to maximize the dose to the tumor and minimize the amount of radiation to any normal structures. And that improves what we call the therapeutic ratio. And the illustration here to the right, which is of cranial spinal radiation, is the classic example of where we really win and, and get a huge uh, you know, bang for our buck in terms of uh, the proton uh, therapy, because it is able to treat the areas that we're int interested in and completely spare a lot of the anterior normal structures by having the protons, um, which are particle radiation therapy, deposit their maximum amount of dose at a certain point and then uh, not have radiation uh, go beyond that. So this is an illustration and I'd say that, you know, this uh, is uh, definitely um, a biased example because we're showing the low grade uh, uh, isodose lines. Um, but at the top, you see uh, the proton radiation therapy, which uh, conforms um, uh, well, well to the uh, tumor. And at the bottom, you see an IMRT or VMAT plan. But I would also put the caveat that what you're seeing in terms of the low dose radiation therapy, even for the IMRT plan, are lines that we aren't always um, necessarily um, you know, uh, following because it's, let's say, example, the blue that you're seeing through the brain is five gray um, at, um, in, let's say, 30 fractions, which is really scattered dose. We're talking about, you know, decimals amounts of radiation therapy um, per day with that. Um, and so this is uh, definitely a more um, 
you could say a visual illustration of uh, the uh, low dose radiation therapy. But when we're really comparing plans and when we use examples actually uh, for our um, trainees, it's not always clear really what is better. Um, and that's because sometimes that low amount of dose of radiation therapy, we can't yet say or don't know yet if that is going to really impact um, uh, patients in the long term. And so in this illustration, you're seeing, you know, to the left, a proton plan and to the right, a VMAT plan. And for the non-radiation oncologists in the room, we use a lot of components to evaluate a radiation plan, not just, you know, the low grade uh, or sort of the low dose um, radiation lines. We're looking at what the coverage of the actual tumor is, which is a priority because we have to make sure we're treat appropriately treating the tumor. And then we also are looking at something called the DVHs um, or the dose volume histogram to see what are the amounts of radiation therapy going to other um, organs at risk or, or normal structures. Um, this happens to be an illustration in which the VMAT plan was just better um, uh, in terms of it meeting the appropriate goals of us covering the tumor while still meeting the organs at risk. And that's not always the case, but just to um, illustrate that it's not always that clear. So that's where we uh, segue into the role of BNC05 which is a study looking at grade two and grade three IDH mutant patients where patients are randomized to protons versus um, IMRT. And it's a national study with the primary endpoint of this being looking at neurocognition. And uh, just as Dr. Weifel's uh, group is um, uh, looking at this, the goal would be to have very fine tuned neurocognitive exams uh, to assess if there's a, a difference in this um, to hopefully in the future, you know, if uh, uh, this shows a signal, perhaps uh, change the standard of care. For grade three gliomas, I won't focus too much on this because we have um, already an established standard of offering radiation therapy and chemotherapy for these uh, patients. Um, and we also recognize that now the question more so, you know, if we know that they need uh, a component radiation therapy, but what the question is, you know, do they need sequential or is concurrent uh, and sequential um, uh, the next approach? And so CODEL, of course, is still enrolling. CATNON has already recently published its second interim analysis. Um, and so the, um, you know, in the past uh, two weeks with some new information uh, from uh, uh, the CATNON group, what the summary is to this is that really the adjuvant uh, component was really more so what was the driving uh, component to the um, uh, outcome uh, benefits for these patients, um, at least in the uh, second interim analysis. I will mention that um, you know, right now in radiation oncology, when we are offering sequential therapy, we favor using doing the radiation first uh, before the chemo, just because based on the ERTC and the um, uh, RTOG9402 study, uh, there were a higher percentage of patients who just never made it to the radiation component um, when chemo was first. So it just happens to be our practice that we tend to offer um, the radiation upfront since it's a critical component to the disease control in the grade three patients. And the last few minutes, what I will go over is actually now this IDH wild type cohort, or what will soon become what we're thinking of um, with the new WHO, molecular GBMs. And so uh, this IDH wild type uh, group actually um, has some interesting uh, findings. So this is why uh, we think that really I, these cohort of patients would benefit primarily possibly from just enrolling on trial because what we see here, even from prior studies um, historically, if you look at unadjust, uh, unadjusted analysis of these patients' outcomes, is that these grade three IDH wild type patients still at three years have a better overall survival than their histological historic, the histological um, and historical GBMs. And so, you know, based already on this, if we know that these patients were not getting the dose escalation and not necessarily getting um, the chemo escalation in terms of treatment, and still at that point had a better survival, then maybe it may, might suggest to us that we don't have an entirely identical population. And so when we start to move towards offering these patients more dose escalation or detreatment escalation uh, with um, either dose escalation as well as chemo um, intensification if we're often concurrent, I think it's um, of note that we also are monitoring these patients and preferably on trial for their adverse events, um, their patient reported outcomes, their risk of radionecrosis and their neurocognition because they may actually with these additional treatments live even longer um, than what we're seeing in these unadjusted analyses. The next component to why it's important, it has to do with actually our outcomes with um, the prior radiation volumes uh, that we were using uh, for traditional um, GBMs. So RTOG does a two centimeter expansion 
um, on uh, the T1 post and the T2 flare with sequ sequential. That's the description uh, from those protocols. Um, for the ERTC or STOOP uh, version, it was a single volume uh, uh, PTV expansion going to 60 gray. And at MD Anderson, we have a slight different variation actually on this with our simultaneously integrated boost approach where we actually will treat these patients for their GTV uh, primarily and put place a PTV on that with that being the boost to 60 gray. And then we'll expand off of that GTV to encompass flare within two centimeters. Uh, and that goes to 50 gray and 30 fractions. With this, it's actually notable for having actually tighter margins um, than what people might be used to when they're thinking about the RTOG uh, volumes. Uh, but we've still had good outcomes in terms of uh, this historical practice uh, in our own institution uh, with, this, with this volume. I think this brings it to, to another point is that for contrast enhancing tumors, um, you know, we can try to assess you know, ways in which we can maybe adapt these volume, volumes and make them potentially tighter uh, than our historical GPMs for these grade two and grade three patients as we are monitoring their toxicity. But it's particularly important for our non-enhancing tumors actually, uh, which are gonna be the majority of the new classification um, for these uh, um, uh, sort of low grade um, uh, patients. And so, uh, or so you could say histological low grades that have um, IDH wild type. Um, so since those patients actually would have um, on their MRI images, non-enhancing, but then at the same time would have IDH wild type molecular features. If we just expand two centimeters off of the non-enhancing component, our volumes actually potentially would be even larger than how we treat our traditional GBMs. And so for that reason, we actually have a protocol in which we are actually uh, testing doing smaller volumes uh, so that we are really concentrating on the 60 gray component going just to tumor. I'd be happy to discuss uh, more of those um, protocol uh, variations um, in the, um, if there are any questions afterwards or in the Q&A. Uh, thank you very much for your time.